My name's Anna Dimitri. Um, I'm an artist and I work um, predominantly with microbiology and robotics as well. Uh, my name's Alex May. Uh, I'm an artist working with digital technologies, uh, video projection, robotics um, and interactive installations. The Archaea Bot project um, is kind of a fusion between the most ancient life form on the planet, um, Archaea, um, which are one of the branches on the tree of life, one of the three domains of life. Very little known, I think, by a lot of people. They're um, more genetically similar to us, um, they're to the eukaryotes, than bacteria, but they look almost identical to bacteria. What we wanted to do was kind of draw a thread across time to, from the most ancient life form to um, kind of the future technologies and think about what might life look like in the future. And Archaea are a kind of life form that is, is evolved to live in highly acidic, hot conditions. The Archaea we're working with, Sulfolobus acidal caldarius, um, was found in the hot springs at Yellowstone Park originally, and it's believed to be one of the most ancient life forms on the planet. Um, and we wanted to fuse that with the most kind of cutting edge AI that we could put into um, something. So, so what we've done is created a robot um, that brings these things together to kind of think about what life might look like when we've kind of destroyed the planet, um, we, that it's acidic, highly polluted, very warm. Um, it was inspired by um, work being undertaken at Imperial College by our collaborator, Amanda Wilson, who's studying the motors that drive these archaea and allow them to swim about. And she looks at these under something called cryomicroscopy, which is a kind of scanning electron microscopy where they use liquid nitrogen to freeze the uh, specimens in three dimensions. So then she's trying to look at these motors and people might know that bacteria have these motors like E. coli bacteria that help them swim about. And they actually look like little kind of cog wheels at a microscope, uh, microscopic level made of proteins. And what the um, MARA project, which Amanda is part of at Imperial College, uh, it's an EU FET project, they're looking at um, trying to understand these motors for future kind of potentially healthcare possibilities to be able to repurpose them and remove the tails and replace them with maybe drill bits, molecular drill bits that could drill into um, cells that we wanted to get rid of, like potentially um, to treat diseases and things like that. I mean, what might life look like in a post-singularity, post-climate change world? I mean, the idea of a singularity is that we cannot forecast what will happen after that. So if we were going to go down that route of believing in this concept of the singularity, and arguably we're constantly living in a singularity um, at the moment. <laughs> um, if, if we were going to go down that route, then that's something that I can't necessarily imagine in a realistic sense, but I can, I can kind of think about it. Um, and climate change, that's maybe a bit easier because we've got um, historical records that we can look back on. Um, the world will carry on, um, I think, but people might disappear from the world um, but we have the kind of ability to possibly create strategies and means to survive um, in a in a post climate change world and I mean in the, in the sort of post humanist transhumanist kind of field um, people look at ideas such as uploading of consciousness. Now, this is really difficult to achieve um, because we don't really understand what consciousness is fully. I mean, this is one of these big philosophical questions. And so there's this idea of uploading of consciousness to there'd be a like, vast computer system in space or something that we'd all be living in, in a kind of matrix-like world. But... I was thinking, like, what if one problem with this idea of uploading is, is that you are no longer embodied 
and a lot of philosophers think that embodied consciousness, our, our bodies or the ability to be embodied is, is integral to consciousness. Um, Francisco Varela talks about how all the muscles and the whole environment is all part of our consciousness, the Chilean biologist. Um, and so maybe we could be uploaded to um, a robotic being or a semi-robotic being. So if you were going to go down the route where we had these robots that we built, obviously the structures that we're building our robot with now, 3D printing, um, things like that, aren't necessarily going to work in the way that we're doing it. But potentially you could build them from the proteins, like the Mara project are looking at building these, these um drills for um, based on the Ar Arkella motors they're looking at building them from DNA origami so potentially you could build something from the molecules that um, create the the um, resistant shells of the Archaea now so we could really combine the Archaea which would be something that would live on they were here at the very beginning um, and they'll be here for a long time past us. So I think in a, in a sort of post-singularity uh, world, uh, I mean, we have, we have a choice about what we want to sort of send into this. Uh, we make choices about, um, you know, what message we might want to leave behind, what would be useful. Uh, you know, we've had, uh, you know, we find stone blocks and uh, metal implements from, you know, civilizations that have gone past and have disappeared. But they're, they're kind of not only markers and, and uh, to the and testament to their, uh, how far they got and how intelligent they were and how, how advanced their technologies were, but also uh, serving as an inspiration for technologies, uh, civilizations in the future. Um, obviously, a lot of our, our skills and our uh, things that we that we do in this world at the moment will be completely useless in, you know um, you know how to build a sofa you know it's probably not going to be so useful in a post singularity uh, world so we again we have we have a choice of, of what uh, would be useful and what you know what messages do we want to send and how might those messages be uh, deconstructed uh, one of the, you know one of the biggest problems over time is language. Uh, again, with things like the Rosetta Stone, you know, we have these, these markers which help us, um, you know, navigate this, this uh, long history of, of communication. Uh, and part of the project that we've looked at is how would we transfer a message uh, from these uh, robots that we're making. And we, we're using a, a, a serial encoded digital audio form uh, obviously, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth don't work underwater, so we, we needed to uh, revert to a, a, a more basic, more sort of uh, suitable communication method. So we're, we're, uh, it'll be sending out messages via sonar, basically, and, and uh, you could decode it with a, with a sort of basic, under, basic understanding of how these signals are generated. There's a repeating pattern that's... Uh, you can pick up with the ear, so you're immediately sort of keyed into there's there's a, a message being passed here. Um, so it's it's interesting uh, to sort of think, you know, how how we might um, send this thing into the future. We're putting an artificial intelligence uh, system into the robot, uh, which is using a back propagation neural network, uh, so that it learns from its environment. Uh, and it's got a, a gyroscopic sensor in there so it can tell um, which uh, way it's sort of facing and an accelerometer to sort of detect how it's moving uh, and a temperature sensor. So sort of a, bit, a very simple uh, set of data that, about its surroundings. Um, so we're going to um, have it recording this data uh, and process it over time uh, and with the result being of what um, colours it will turn, because it's going to have lighting in it, and when to turn the motors on and off. Uh, Archaea are really very, very basic life forms that they, they don't have any 
uh, sort of intention or idea about where they're going or they're not swimming to a destination. They're, they're just spinning these tails and, and hoping it takes them somewhere where there's more food. Um, so we're, we're working on a similar principle where we're going to develop this neural network to uh, devise what the needs might be for this robot. And again, in a sort of post-singularity world, um, its needs will obviously be some sort of food, power, um, and how it might sort of get to that is, is something that we, we're going to evolve over the course of the project. With the, with the AI, we're, we're not trying to replicate exactly an archaea. We could, we could model, make a scientific model of a, the behaviour of an archaea and put that into the robot. We don't want to do that necessarily. What we want to do is use um, the kind of sort of cutting edge AI that is being used nowadays behind the algorithms that are being used to control all sorts of things about how we exist in the world. Um, and to, to kind of understand how this might look in a life form like that. We've been working with the University of Hertfordshire where we're research fellows in the computer science department, and we have been for some time, um, and our system residents. And um, we um, discussed with um, Professor Daniel Polani, who's a professor of artificial intelligence, what kind of control system we should use for the robot. And he suggested a homeokinesis system, which is a kind of dynamic equilibrium in a, in a bodily process. So it's something that um, will be far more interesting to observe than um, homeostasis, which is something that people normally think of as a, as a kind of representation of life. The idea of um, seeing whether, um, you know, like um, homeostasis is to try and keep your, keep your situation in the same way. So, for instance, an example of that would be um, sweating or the hairs on your body pricking up is like you're trying to regulate your temperature. So even if we were just sitting there, we would we would be regulating our temperature and things. Um, a homeokinetic system is more dynamic than that. So we're interested to see how this will this will work out as well. So this has been a, a challenging project on many uh, levels, uh, not least because we're creating an underwater robot. Um, and while we've uh, created a lot of different robots, uh, from humanoid to uh, sort of small mobile ones, uh, obviously we've never created one that, that actually is designed to run underwater. So uh, a lot of the research has, has been how to do it and how to make it work uh, over a long period of time. We've got motors in there and lights and sensors and all these things. Uh, so all of this needs to run for uh, as long as possible. Uh, and, as a, as a sort of self-contained uh, unit. Um, so we've, um, and we, we ended up by sort of 3D printing the case and then coating all the, the internals with um, uh, this sort of uh, plastic uh, paint on rubber uh, liquid. Um, and this seems to work very nicely. I think one of the other challenges of the project was um, to actually design the robot motors. So we've been working with Amanda Wilson, who's studying these, but the research is not finished yet. Um, and they're looking at other um, different archaea as well in the project. And so they have a model of what an archaea motor looks like, but it's kind of, it's very abstract. They have a sort of um, animation of this and it's kind of blobs and blobs and blobs but if you kind of take that information and spinning things um, and you compare that to um, micrographs of um, bacterial motors um, then what we needed to do was kind of make a fusion between that and we're still developing that and we'll still be developing the motor um, as their research develops as well so there'll be more um, casings built different materials as well later on I think I think I often get asked this question what can art do for science and I think that's kind of the wrong question in a way because because it's not about this instrumentalization of art 
um, as a kind of PR tool for science. It's, it's more about an exploration. And I think there's a misunderstanding, and it's not coming necessarily from the scientists who, are, who in my experience, are very open to working with artists and re exploring these um, more esoteric questions in, in, that relate to their work and tell stories about their work. There's also, um, I think, a misunderstanding that science isn't driven by aesthetics. It, it very much is. Um, scientists tell me that they love the bacteria that they work with. I know scientists who love Clostridium difficile. I know scientists who love tuberculosis. Um, they, there's an awe and a power in these organisms um, that the scientists um, that we work with, the idea of looking at these very tiniest things. I, I've written quite a lot about the relationship of microbiology and the sublime, and this, this, this idea of these tiny, awe-inspiring things, like the idea of this most ancient life form. These things are being... The scientists that we work with respond to these just as much on the aesthetic level as the artists do. And these questions are rattling around in their heads and in the public consciousness as well when they hear about them. They're, it's not necessarily these stories that are taught to people. People don't learn about Archaea um, very much in schools and things. Well, not in, in my experience, anyway. Um, but when they find out, they're fascinated. So there's a lot of storytelling and a lot of relating it to the aesthetic side as well from both art and science. So it's about another not necessarily even that different way of understanding the world. It's, 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 it's maybe um, the way I think of it as a kind of meta-discipline that allows you to bring science, history, um, philosophy, different areas all together into, into a, in my case, usually, or in our case, an object um, or, an, or, an, or a projection or something like that, but in, into an artwork that... Um, can have these multiple layers within it. So I, I never really see there's that much delineation between art, science. It's it's uh, fundamentally the it's it's about people doing these things, and I think that often in science this gets lost um, because there's this, especially now there's such specialisation and, and there's such um, huge work that goes on to. Uh, do the minutest pipetting of samples day in, day out to work towards um, scientific discoveries that, that you may never even get to hear about, but it's, it's sort of stepping stones of, of science. Um, and most of this sort of gets lost in, in, in the story. We hear about the big, uh, you know, the big findings, the big announcements. Uh, but there's so many people involved, there's so many uh, people working towards that moment and we forget sometimes it's about the people it's people doing this these curious people who um, are sitting there day in day out sort of hitting their head against the wall trying to figure out um, what's going on and sometimes you know as, as an artist going into those situations um, there's a lot of stuff that, that can be bought out and, and stories to be told and, and because it's stories can be around these discoveries. They're not. They're not. The story isn't just the discovery. It's around the people who do it and around uh, everything that leads up to it. And it's a sort of rich tapestry of the history of these things that uh, art is is particularly good at sort of highlighting. And um, and it doesn't always science isn't isn't always successful in its in its goals and aims. But um, there's a lot to understand about the journey. And I think that's where art can come in.